Hey friends, it's Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, on this week's episode, we are joined once again by our friend Brock Hollett. Brock is the author of the book, Debunking Preterism. And as I've said before, if you don't have this book, you have to get this book. It's an essential book to have in your library to equip yourself to be able to um, understand and defend the truth against the creeping error of preterism in all of its forms. So, Brock, welcome back to the underground. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You bet. You bet. So, um, in the last episode we had you on, we talked about this issue of the coming of the Son of Man. Um, this is such a critical, central issue to the biblical testimony. And uh, we looked at the different ways that preterism distorts this. Um, in this episode, we're going to talk about the issue of the abomination of desolation, the abomination that causes desolation, because this really sort of within the end time biblical narrative to, to sort of understand the, the timeline, the timeline, the unfolding of end time events, the abomination of desolation, it's kind of a strange term, but it really stands as such a critical uh, marker. And it's, it's used, it's referred to by Jesus, again, as sort of this uh, specific time marker to help us understand these things. But it's also centrally discussed in the book of Daniel. So Jesus refers to the um, abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, of course, Mark 13, Luke 21, in the Olivet Discourse, all of the Synoptic Gospels. And it's also mentioned, and this is really the foundation uh, of it, in Daniel four times. And it's interesting because I've, I've really looked at this pretty extensively. You know, in each of these different passages, it's sometimes words it slightly different, but it's clearly always referring to the same event. So in Daniel 8, verses 12 through 14, right there sort of in the middle of Daniel 8, as well as Daniel 9, 27, Daniel eleven thirty one, and then again in chapter 12, verse 11, four times it refers to the abomination of desolation. Now, this is the Bible is often a little bit more simple than we often um, treat it. You know, this is always referring to the same event, and so this is a, a an important thing. And then Jesus harkens back to it, and he again uses it as an important timing uh, event to understand the un unfolding of end time prophecy. So essentially, what the abomination of desolation is just probably in the simplest definition, is that in the middle of this final seven-year period before the return of Jesus, in the middle of this, this uh, Shavua, the middle of this um, seven-year period, you have the covenant that was made is broken, okay? And so the Antichrist enters into the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, and he causes offerings, the, the temid temid, the daily offerings, the perpetual sacrifice. He causes that to cease. He causes offerings to cease. And he, he uh, commits blasphemy against God. He sets himself up there in the temple. So we've got various uh, echoes in history. You know, you've got Antiochus Epiphanes spreading, uh, sacrificing a pig in the temple and spreading the the pork gravy, if you will, all over the temple, defiling the temple and different things like that. So we have events in history that are sort of foreshadows, but yet this is an event that is yet to come, that the Antichrist will yet carry out. And if we get this wrong, um, then it's a, again, it's an easy event to sort of, uh, if you skew this one, then it allows so many other events to be skewed as well. One of the quotes I have in my book says, the inability of preterists to definitively identify this abomination of desolation in history, in the first century, is an often observed weakness of the entire system. This weakness is especially troubling for the preterist system because the Lord taught that the abomination will be the climatic, climactic event that signifies the arrival of the unprecedented tribulation and the end of the age. And so Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, he said, uh, let the reader understand. And in the context, he says, um, that when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, 
then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and so forth. Because why? The tribulation, the epicenter of that tribulation, the final tribulation, the greatest one will, will be in Jerusalem and will spread out from there. So the saints and those that he, Jesus, is warning are to flee at that time. And then we know from Daniel, I mean, he points the reader back, let the reader understand this isn't commentary of the synoptic writers saying, oh, by the way, listen to what Jesus is saying. Let the reader of Jesus' words understand. This is the words of Jesus saying, let the reader of Daniel understand. That's why he points us back to Daniel. So like Joel said, when you go back and you look at those, those passages in Daniel, he says, Jesus says, the abomination of desolation. So he points us to the desolation. And the language is very similar, most similar to uh, Daniel 11.31 and 12.11. But also almost every commentator says that he is using Daniel 9.27. Of course, we would also throw in there Daniel 8, like you said, Joel, uh, because the, the passage clearly is talking about the time of the end in the latter days and so forth. But um, we also see this in 2 Thessalonians 2, when Paul talks about the man of sin taking his place, his seat in the temple of God and magnifying himself above all that can be called God and every so-called God, which, of course, is a quote from Daniel chapter 11, where the same abomination is spoken of there. And we know that, that Daniel connected the time of that desolation with the unprecedented tribulation in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, right, where he connects that uh, both chronologically and thematically. Not only the tribulation, but actually the resurrection of the dead. This is important. Thank you. I missed that, but that is absolutely essential that we catch the, we catch the power of that. And then also in Revelation chapter uh, twelve and thirteen, we see this this forty two month period. We see the time times and half a time. We see the uh, um, the forty two months. All of that is the, the same three and a half year period that Daniel was speaking of. And of course, John in Revelation 12 talks about how Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot for those 42 months. The two witnesses will prophesy during that time, the times, times, and half a time. Again, all those are quotes from Daniel. Again, everybody's pushing us back to Daniel. So if we miss the abomination in Daniel, we, we, we may, and actually many do stumble over this, and they miss what is, was uh, in the sealed book of Daniel. And it's supposed to be revealed to those that have the mind of Christ in the New Testament. So we need to understand a couple things um, first. We need to understand that when the abomination is set up, there is three and a half years. There's 42 months. There's a time, times, and half a time. All, again, all talking about the same time period. And so we would expect to see an event, if the preterists are correct, we would expect to see an event known as the abomination of desolation, and then we'd have three and a half years of tribulation, and then we'd have the end of the age, which, of course, you can look back at our last video that, that Joel did with, with me, where uh, clearly that's talking about the return of Jesus. And so if the preterists are correct, we would also expect to see that, too, in the first century, which clearly we don't. But what we want to focus on today is, did we see the abomination in the first century? So there are four basic interpretations that preterists put forth. And the fact, and Joel, you pointed this out to me, it's not that I didn't know it, but it didn't really click until you said it just the other day. You said, Brock, you know, the fact that preterists have to posit so many different ideas of what the abomination could be, and they disagree amongst themselves, just shows just how confusing and convoluted that this whole idea is, that the abomination happened in the first century. I think, I, I think that's what you were saying, right? Yeah, with regard to the abomination, with regard to so many issues, they very rarely can agree because it's not clear because they're trying to sort of draw this from events and time periods when you know the Bible's not pointing to. And so that's why they so fundamentally disagree. It's not that futurists agree on everything, but we we agree on the basics, you know, in terms of uh, you know, the, the Antichrist is coming, there's three and a half years, and then, you know, so on and so forth. But they're just sort of all over the place. Yeah, that's right. And so uh, I want to introduce the different basic preterist interpretations, how they, how they view the abomination, and why each of those views fall apart at a very foundational level. The first preterist interpretation is that this guy, Cestius Gallus, who was uh, sent, he was a commander sent in by Emperor Nero to squash the Jewish revolt in uh, the year, in, around November of AD 66. Okay, he was sent in to squash the revolt. So many preterists say that maybe that's the abomination of desolation. But the thing about this is, is if the destruction of Jerusalem happened in AD 70, which virtually all preterists agree, uh, then 
the then the actions of Cestius Gallus happened too early to allow for a, for uh, for forty two months or three and a half years. They happened way too early. In other words, there's way too much time. There's a full four years between the actions of Gallus and the destruction of Jerusalem. So it simply doesn't fit the prophecies that we see in Daniel and so forth. And did he did Cestius cause offerings to cease? He did not cause any offerings to cease. Uh, there was a there was interestingly enough there was a some pigeons being offered by uh, by some folks in a different part of Israel, not in Jerusalem, and that sort of that offering that they were doing with the pigeons sparked uh, outrage from the Roman soldiers, which then caused the Roman soldiers to step in, which then caused a lot of Jews to be angry, which many say is the beginning of the Jewish Rome, the first Jewish Roman war that it sort of spawned that or began that. However, we got to realize those sacrifices have absolutely, they have absolutely nothing to do with the Tamid offering that Daniel spoke of, nothing to do with the daily sacrifice, certainly nothing to do with the temple in Jerusalem. So that's key. Plus, um, there were no idols or abominations. And that word abomination, um, most commentators almost across the board say that the abomination is referring to an idol or an idolatrous action or event, almost certainly an idol though. And there was nothing associated with Cestius Gallus that would be considered an abomination. So I think that we can, I think it's fair and safe to, to rule out that interpretation as a possible abomination. Okay. Okay. So there's number one. So preterist interpretation number two, they see the abomination of desolations as the actions associated with the revolutionary zealots uh, or the Edomians, which are the, which was the first century word for the Edomites, the ancient Edomites. Okay. Now what happened was, is there was a civil war of sorts going on in Jerusalem at this time in history. And as a result, some of the, one of the factions invited the zealots and hired the mercenaries, the Edomians, to actually come into the temple. They let them into the city gates of Jerusalem and they worked their way through a series of battles into the temple courts, which eventually led to the mass murder and mayhem of Jerusalem and ultimately to its hasty, and not hasty, I mean, but uh, hastier fall of Jerusalem by the Romans. Okay, because basically it starved out the, the Jews who actually did have uh, things to eat. So, but here's the problems with that view, seeing the Zealots and the Edomians as the abomination desolation. And this is probably the most common view amongst preterists is to see these actions as being the abomination. As it pertains to the second temple, okay, and this is important because Daniel and Jesus and everybody connected the temple, what the actions in the temple. As it pertains to the second temple, the events of the Edomians and the Zealots occurred much too late to allow for at least three and a half years of unprecedented tribulation before <clears throat> before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 because the Edomites surrounded the city in AD 68. So it only leaves two years before AD 70. So hardly would any of that qualify as an abomination that then takes three and a half years before uh, the end of the age. The, uh, the zealots actually removed a Thanksgiving sacrifice for Caesar, but it was, again, nowhere near Jerusalem. It was not the Tamid offering of the temple. The Tami, the daily sacrifice, ended in AD 70 for the second temple. So you have the ending of the Tamid and the destruction of Jerusalem basically happening very, very close to each other, certainly not three and a half years apart. This is sort of a fatal flaw of seeing the prophecy, these prophecies as having been fulfilled in the first century. It happened much too late chronologically. Um, plus, the, the abomination wasn't taken away by, by a real invader. There was no northern king or any, any person, per se, that came in and set up an abomination. And there's no significant antichrist figure or man of lawlessness or uh, beast or call him what you will amongst the Edomians or zealots that fits the description of, of these, uh, these prophecies. So every proposal of an individual to meet the description was virtually unknown. There's no one in this view that fits the criteria, or they died much sooner than AD 70, uh, which of course is the preterist so-called coming of the Son of Man, um, or the, re the realization of the coming of the Son of Man. Or these individuals, they just lived several years beyond AD 70, 70 so they weren't killed at the breath of his coming and, the, and uh, that we would expect as according to Revelation 19 and Isaiah and so forth. So, I mean, this is just another example where the Bible gives us a handful, at least, of very specific criteria in order for the prophecy to be fulfilled. And so what each of these positions will do is they'll say, well, one of the fingers was fulfilled, 
but then the other, you know, the other three fingers and thumb were not, you know, do, do not meet the criteria, this sort of thing. And in order for any particular interpretation to actually be considered legitimate, it has to meet all of the clear biblical criteria. So that one obviously uh, clearly falls short. So interpretation number three. Preterist interpretation three, seeing the abomination as being associated with the actions of Emperor Vespasian and his son, General Titus. This is probably the second most common approach. Uh, we see this with uh, J. Stuart Russell and some of the stalwarts of preterism. Okay, And so this view goes like this. It says that basically when the Roman legions came into Jerusalem, into the holy place, that their graven images, you know, it had their standards had uh, golden eagles and they were given in honor of the Lord Caesar and God, the God, the God on earth and things like that. And so by virtue of taking those idols into the holy place, this, according to these guys, represents the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Again, another problem with this is that it removes any abomination from the temple complex because Emperor Vespasian and General Titus, whether in their first um, invasion of the city or in Titus's subsequent invasion of the city, they did not enter Jerusalem's walls until AD 70, which is much too late to constitute the abomination. Now, remember, the daily sacrifice in the second temple ended in AD 70, but again, that's, again, much too late. And Vespasian and Titus, when they began their initial assault, remember they were sent by Nero. They, uh, Emperor Vespasian was still a general at this point. This was in the late spring of AD 68. Okay, they were sent to squash the rebellion. And then there was a hiatus. There was a time where after Nero had, had been killed, he died by the sword and so forth, that Emperor Vespasian went back to Rome to claim his throne. And he said, Titus, hold off on the siege for a while. Let's get this squared away. So there was actually a hiatus. Okay, but again, much too late to allow for three and a half years. Titus then resumed the assault in the spring of AD 69. The final assault wasn't even until the late summer of AD 70. All three of these events, all three happened, Joel, much too late to allow for the chronology, the specificity that God so requires in his holy word. And again, this gets back to something real crucial. Do we believe God? Do we believe that God is in the details? Do we believe that God knows the future? If the answer is yes, we can't compromise on these things. We can't settle for a prophetic foreshadowing or a prefigurement as being the exhaustive fulfillment of these prophecies. We can't and we must not do that. Right. I mean, if he repeatedly says three and a half years, 42 months, et cetera, you know, it sort of reiterates the same time frame using multiple descriptions. You can't say, well, he said 42 months, but what he really meant was three months. Close enough. You know, it just it just doesn't work. And and really, there's I mean, regardless, it's not just an issue of shoehorning. I mean, it's like this isn't even close. This is it's not even it's not even on the dartboard. You know? Yeah, that's right. And I think it's it, and this is so like God. He he allows us an excuse. You know, like in Romans 1 and in 2 Thessalonians 2, he allows people to have an excuse. He allows it to be similar enough that it could be that they could take the bait if they want it. He could turn them over to their own desires if they want it. He could allow an academic argument that is, um, you know, finagles things and skews things and pushes around peg into a square hole. They could the, you might almost be convinced. But if we're letting the Holy Spirit of God work on our hearts in humility, and we're looking at the details and the specifics of the prophecies, we can't go for it. We simply can't go for it. So preterist interpretation number four, that the abomination refers to the actions of the high priests in Jerusalem and what the sacrifices that they made and the things that they did in the Jerusalem temple after the cross of Jesus. So the idea goes like this. We know from the book of Hebrews and elsewhere that what Jesus did on the cross with his finished work, that it fulfilled many of the prophetic types of the, certainly of the sacrificial system, fulfilling, fulfilling that by the death of his body on the cross. And so the idea goes is that any sacrifices, according to the preterists, that happen after that cannot be memorial or have some kind of atoning effect, certainly not. But they are considered an abomination because they did not, by virtue of being you know, having these these sacrifices of goats and bulls and so forth, they actually undermine and thwart the power of the cross, and therefore they're abominations. And so the idea goes like this, and this is a theory of Gary DeMar. I don't know if it's original with him. Uh, he says that, look, 
any abomination by these high priests after the cross of Jesus is the abomination of desolation. There's all kinds of problems with this view. Um, for example, Jesus said that this is the sign when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. All the other signs that were before this, just the beginning of birth pains, the time is not yet, the end is not here, don't go running after them. But when you see the abomination of desolation, you know that my coming is near. You know the end of the age has arrived and that we're, we're wrapping this thing up. And we know from Daniel that that's true. We got three and a half years. But if that abomination is the sign that, that, so that we know that the return of our Lord is at hand, then how is it that um, this was already happening just a few days? Well, actually happening the day after Jesus was crucified on the cross. This is hardly the sign that shows that the great, uh, that the great and unprecedented tribulation of three and a half years has begun. Clearly not. I mean, that, that anachronistically doesn't fit at all. Uh, because, again, it takes place the week that Jesus delivered the Olivet Discourse, a day after Jesus was crucified and cut off from the land of the living. This can't. This doesn't work. Remember also that the Jewish Christians participated in the observance of the Torah, the, the Judean Christians, um, after the death of Jesus. And yet we don't see that being considered an abomination or to use Gary DeMar's language, uh, like the offering of swine's flesh, right? To, he says, you know, if... Uh, we see this in Acts 21, uh, verses 20 through 24, and 25, verse 8, where the, these Christians were keeping Torah. And yet there was, there was something not cons, um, inconsistent with the offering that Jesus offered up on the cross. So the destruction of the se second temple, it occurred nearly three decades after the crucifixion of Jesus. But putting the abomination with these actions of the high priest puts it three decades too early. It puts any removal of the daily sacrifice way too early to begin the final week of years of Daniel, or certainly the last three and a half years, right? And contrary to what Gary DeMar is saying, his view also requires a gap. A gap? That's impossible. He, there was simply no, and this is, this is the appeal. Now, now listen carefully, uh, for those of you that are listening. Remember that the abomination, the, the, de, the abomination of desolation happens at the same time that the daily sacrifice is removed. Gary knows that if he is to avoid the idea of placing a gap between the 69th uh, week of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 and the 70th week of Daniel, like, by the way, all the early, well, many of the early church fathers taught and the historic churches taught. It was not an invention of modern dispensationalism or, or Irenaeus, Hippolytus, the, especially Irenaeus and Hippolytus. Um, he wants to avoid a gap so badly because it lends credence to futurism. So in order to avoid the gap, he has to put the abomination of desolation and the removal of the daily offering uh, within a few years after the crucifixion of Jesus, the cutting off an anointed one. And it simply won't work. There has to be a gap. And this is a problem for all preterists. There is no way they can avoid that. Yeah, the reason I made uh, the joke about the gap is because Gary mocks futurists for their belief in a gap, but then he offers an alternative view with a gap. Um, you know, so it's it's uh, hypocritical. Grant, granted, our gap is bigger, but the point is, it's kind of irrelevant. 35, 40 years um, versus you know any number of years. There's a gap, and it's just either there is or there isn't. Right. And our gap is, I would prefer our gap because our gap is prophesied in scripture. This is the inner Advent period. This is the mystery of the Gentiles coming in. It was hidden in previous ages, but now revealed in the New Testament. So um, final thing I would say, it's just getting back to this idea of the early church fathers. You mentioned Hippolytus and Irenaeus. They taught and you go back and look, this is not an invention of modern dispensationalism or modern premillennialism or post-trip, any of that. This was taught by the early church fathers, not only premillennialism, but look, that a future personal antichrist would set up an idol in the third temple in Jerusalem and that he would claim to be God. And then he would subsequently and shortly thereafter be destroyed at the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ at his return. That is indisputable. Go back and look at the church fathers. The idea that Gary and some of these guys have posited that this was an invention of modern dispensationalism in the 19th century is just simply, it's, it's verifiably false. Right. And so all of this being said, and I point, you can go through my uh, chapter five in my book, the long of the short is, Regardless of what preterist interpretation of the abomination is out there, they all fall apart. None of them allow for an abomination of desolation by this northern king. And by the way, all of those passages in Daniel show what? They show a prideful king or prince 
who would take away the daily sacrifice, not Jesus. Jesus is not the one taking away the daily sacrifice in, in Daniel 9. In the other three places, it's clearly this, this, this person. So in order to have consistency, we have to see this as the Antichrist. And so all, all those positions fall apart. We're still looking for the future Antichrist to enter into the third temple and to set up his abomination prior to the return of Jesus when he will be destroyed by the brightness of our Lord's coming. Right, right. Yeah, so what Brock's referring to there is you have some people who will say that in Daniel 9, 27, it's Jesus who causes the offerings to cease, whereas it's just not tenable. You've got four references in the book of Daniel to offerings ceasing, to the temple being abominated, to it being desolated, it being defiled, and it always links these things integrally together. So you can't say three of them are talking about the Antichrist, but the other one's talking about Jesus and yet we see a lot of um, interpreters try to do that, so it just doesn't work. So that's fantastic. Uh, just curiously, Brock, how has, um, I mean, I'm sure since your book has come out, you've had preterists respond and um, so forth. Has anyone responded to this particular problem with preterism? Um, no, not really. I've had uh, just a handful of people, maybe two or three people who have tried to say things on Facebook dealing with this specific thing, but it's not because they've read my book. This is the interesting thing. Very few preterists that I interact with or happen to come across, they haven't read the book. Very few of them have read the book. If they would simply take the time to read the book and see the arguments, uh, they would be able to interact more intelligently with me, but they, they simply haven't. And uh, I think that's one of the problems. I mean, at least Don Preston and some of these guys have taken the time to purchase the book. And I assume he's read it. He se it seems like he's read some of it, at least, and, and to try to interact with the arguments. So I would, uh, I would encourage the reader to simply purchase the book, read through it, and then let's talk. If you're going to talk uh, in, an, in a kind Christian way, uh, then, then you, you know, I'll interact with you on, online or so forth. Yeah, exactly. And that's what Paul said. You know, I referenced it earlier. He he kind of says, like, pay no attention to those who, you know, espouse this this vain babbling. Um, but then he kind of then hints, he says, you know, unless someone is willing to perhaps be corrected um, and, and recognize that they're actually destroying, shipwreck, shipwrecking the faith of some, um, as Hymenaeus and Philetus, you know, those who say the resurrection has already taken place. So, well, again, Brock, fantastic. This is really, really good. Um, I've, uh, I've never really dug into and sort of delved into the preterist understanding of the abomination of desolation. I've never realized that it's such a huge hurdle for them. Um, but just to see, you know, it, it, this is a great example, but I know there's a few other examples where they just can't agree amongst themselves. You know, they've got multiple different interpretations. And so that rather than being able to offer a clear uh, answer to the text, you know, they just sort of do the shotgun approach and say, well, it might be one of these. But again, we just know that it, it's not yet future because we know that it must be, you know, sort of a priori assumption that it must be past fulfilled. Yet, if you can't find an, an example in history, then maybe the entire system needs to be reconsidered. So friends, again, um, if you don't have the book, Debunking Preterism, as I've said before, make sure you get it. It's just, it's an essential resource it's a great Bible study. Yes, it's a little bit more advanced. I mean, if you're just starting into the world of biblical prophecy, it's it's meaty. Um, but for those who really take the Word of God seriously and are, are really giving themselves to this, it's an essential, essential book. So um, again, do grab that. So that is all the time that we have for this week. Uh, friends, thank you so much for being with us. Look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Music